Welcome to another episode of the Stadium Journey Podcast. Thanks for joining us. Stadium Journey is the ultimate stop for the traveling sports fan. Our website, stadiumjourney.com, contains over 2,500 stadium reviews, news items, and more. In addition to the website, we are all over social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Like us, follow us, comment, share, all that good stuff. And the Stadium Journey Podcast is the perfect companion to listen to while you're on a road trip. Just type in HIAC Talk Radio. Look for the black and red logo on whatever search app you use. Or you can find us on Spotify. Hopefully, still. Yes, no, maybe still. I want to Spotify. In addition, all of our old video podcasts are on the Stadium Journey YouTube channel. It's perfect for binge watching. And if you happen to be watching this podcast at a later date, remember, we stream live on Tuesday nights at twitch.tv slash danlaw83. And let me welcome in our starting lineup again for tonight. We've got Dave Cotney here. Follow him at ProFan9. Mark Viquez is online at Ballpark Hunter. Dan Kalachico, the above average comedian, is here with us. You can find him at DanLaw83. And I am Paul Baker. You can follow me at PuckmanRI. Now, you may be asking yourself, why is the Stadium Journey podcast crew recording on a Thursday night? Well, the answer is so we can be joined by tonight's guest, the general manager of the Danville Otterbots, Austin Share. Austin, thanks for joining us tonight. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for adjusting. Thanks for being flexible. Uh, we are in the middle of baseball season, so I just feel like we're all just working on that stretch at first base. We got to get all the way down. <laughs> Don't say stretch. I'm too old for stretching. Although, par- <laughs> although first base is probably the only position I could play at this point in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Austin, it was, uh, how shall we say this, a very eventful offseason for, for you all in Danville and in the rest of the Appalachian League. You want to walk our listeners through what happened this winter? Appalachian. I said it wrong again, didn't I? <laughs> so, damn, look, damn you, Yankees. You're, you're not the only one. We we had a whole MLB Network special ran on us, and I think I was up to about 19 or 20 on the Appalachian count. Uh, you know, it, it's okay. It, it is what it is. As a kid from the, the base of the Appalachians in North Carolina, it is a little bit personally offensive, but I'm not going to let it get to me. I just got to keep rolling with the punches. So, um, yeah, Paul, it is. It it has been a, it has been a winter for the ages. It has been an off season for the ages. Um, I've told all of our season ticket holders uh, they are more than welcome to take all the photos and videos of me they would like after opening night. Um, I literally grew up at ballparks. There has not been a summer of my life that I hadn't spent at a ballpark until last summer, and I can guarantee you. At some point, I don't know if it's going to be during the national anthem, first pitch, post game, but I'm just going to start crying. And it's going to be happy tears, but I'm just going to start crying. Um, it's been a long time coming and um, could not be uh, on a personal level, on an organizational level, more proud, more happy, um, more excited to be a part of this new Appalachian League. Um, obviously, the the restructuring of baseball I'll, I'll leave that. We, we might have to do a part two because we could go a whole hour and a half on that. But um, there's a lot of of positives. There's a lot of, of, uh, you know, negatives, both perceived and, and otherwise. And um, for the Appalachian League to have been able to stay together. Uh, yes, we are a different level. Yes, uh, the players will be different. Yes, all the teams have rebranded, but it's these same 10 great communities, these same 10 incredible ballparks, all within driving distance of each other in these wonderful historic towns. Um, I, we just couldn't be more excited. So um, if, if you want to know any specifics about the process, I'm more than happy to tell you. I could probably go day by day from like October through now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been, um, it, it's been unforgettable, but I can't wait to forget it. Be the most fun you never want to have again. Is that correct? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess the first thing on my mind is the new team, Brandon, the Otterbots. Have to say very unique name, made quite a splash when it first came out. Uh, I have to say your logo looks like a villain that would have been on the Transformers or Silverhawks back in the 1980s when I was eating my Cheerios and Silver watching the Hawks. cartoons. Oh my God. How on earth did are. you how on earth did you come up with this name? When did that light bulb come up and say, This is the name we're going it? I don't care what anybody says. So I, I feel like um you know, uh, just before I say anything else, I do want to make it abundantly clear that I could not, again, be more proud to be a part of this league. And part of that pride, I, I think 
every team knocked their rebrand out of the park for different yes. reasons, right? But I, I really do think we were 10 for 10 across the board. All that said, we're clearly the best, and it's not a question. And I just want to make <laughs> that abundantly clear as well. Oh, no, <laughs> but, um, but so a little we, cocky, we had, don't you think? All right. Yeah, yeah. No, we, um, we we had an interesting uh, an interesting journey. So um, here in Danville, baseball has been around dating back to the early 1900s. There have been teams here. They've left. They've come back under different names. They've come back under the same name. The old ballpark uh, that the Danville Leafs, featuring guys just throwing it out there Willie as McCovey. you know, good as Leon Wagner and Willie McCovey. Yes, that's right. Willie McCovey was right here in Danville. He um, they played at uh, at Baloo Park or School Field Park. Um, that stadium is no longer in Danville, but competitive baseball is still played there. Yeah. Our little brothers down in Burlington actually <sighs> use that stadium as their field. So the city of Burlington and to the sock puppets, you are very welcome for your gorgeous ballpark constructed and initially used right here in Danville. Um, most recently, the Atlanta Braves had their affiliate here uh, for 27 years. Um, and uh, after 27 years of a single affiliate, there's an entire generation that are Braves fans, right? So it's, it's pretty cool to see, uh, you know, kids from five to 25 uh, in Danville, Virginia, that have such strong allegiances to a team, you know, 500, 600 miles uh, down to the south. Because of that allegiance, because of that history of baseball here in Danville, it would have been easy to fall back to one of those old monikers, right? Like the Danville 97s, there's this great Johnny Cash song, the Ballad of the Wreck of the 97 or the Ballad of the Old 97. Um, you know, that wreck took place here in Danville. The Brightleaf Tobacco Market, um, which, you know, continued down back to my hometown of Durham, started right here in Danville and the Danville Leafs um, had a great moniker. There was a Negro American Association team uh, here that actually had lights at their ballpark. They were one of the first ballparks in the country to be able to play night games. Um, they were the Danville Stars, then the Danville All-Stars. So there were all these great historic names. There's also this rich history of textiles and trains and tobacco and the river and life from the river and catfish. Um, we, we could have drawn upon that. If I'm going to be completely honest with you, if it was up to me, I would have missed. Like, I would have missed the boat. Um, I'm not from here. It would not have been my place to try to name this team independently. So we ended up running a Name the Team contest for two weeks, and we received over 600 names from community members on what they wanted the team to be. Full transparency, our intention was to find one name that clicked, right? Like, I was expecting to be able to read through those submissions and see one and say, good gracious, there's no way we can't go with that. But there was such a wide array of names that came in. What we ended up doing was actually taking several themes that we saw. Otters were one. You know, the, the river was by far the biggest general theme. If you boil down to wildlife in the river, it was catfish and otters. The Carolina Mudcats are good friends of ours. They're just, you know, an hour and 10 minutes down the road. We didn't want to stamp on their parade. So otters were the clear favorite. Um, shout out to the Evansville otters. They are, are the only other otter logo in baseball. We're the only robotic otter. So where the hell did the bots come from? Well, after talking to folks around the community, after looking at what not just Danville, but Southside Virginia is doing in terms of STEM and STEAM education, um, it was very clear to us that we didn't want to go back to the past. We wanted to attach to something in the future. And somebody submitted the name, the River City Battle Bots. And I'll never forget seeing that because that was the first time I'd seen bots, but they tied it back in their description to that future of advanced machining, precision manufacturing, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, education that has been worked into the curriculum for our students here. Um, obviously, BattleBots is a TLC trademark, so we weren't going to get our pants suit off no matter what. Um, so we started looking at, hey, what can we do to have some fun here? As soon as the, the, the combination, that, that combined word, I'm blanking on the actual English term for it, um, compound, uh, that, that OtterBots came up. It, it was it was the winner like it was the immediate oh my gosh here we go and then the colors the logo our mascot which will be unveiled in a couple weeks here um neighborhoods throughout the ballpark that have not yet been publicized all of them will be named after additional themes that we saw come through that name the team contest so otters and bots are not the only two that we saw from those submissions that we will activate but again as soon as we saw those words together it was a no-brainer yeah was there a second place name that, or was <laughs> so, Otterbots, that's it? 
No, it, no question. It's a really good question. There, there were ones that came through that gave us uh, significant thought pieces, I'll okay. say, just because of how wacky they were. Um, two that really stick out to me that I've talked about in, in uh, you know, local paper interviews um, for anybody from Danville listening to this, you're going to, you're going to hear it for the second time. But um, the Danville wood boogers was one that really stuck out to me. Um, apparently there is a Bigfoot esque creature that lives in the Appalachian mountains that is referred to in some neighborhoods and, and towns as a wood booger. So think about the mascot would have been awesome. Again, shout out to the rebrands across this league. What Elizabethton was able to do, not only with their name, their colors, their logo, but also that awesome kind of Sasquatch-esque mascot is going to be really, really cool. Um, and also shout out to the Eugene Emeralds for, for being first to, to that party. But Wood Boogers was one. Uh, another one was Chunker Dunkers. Um, and uh, the, the Danville Chunker Dunkers, it was an otter-based name. So the description was otters like to have fun, otters like to swim, otters like to jump into water to make splashes. Imagine an otter doing a cannonball into the Dan River. So Chunker Dunkers was the name that, that came through. Hilarious, hilarious, but what could we have done beyond that initial logo of an otter jumping in into a river? Um, again, the, the amount of, of names that called back to those old uh, team monikers were there. I, I don't want to downplay the significance, you know, getting, I think, 21 uh, for the Danville Leafs and I think 22 or 23 for the, the old 97s or the 97s. That's not something to ignore. And again, just kind of stay tuned for those additional components nice. of the ballpark, the mascot and the brand that we have not yet uh, yet announced. So, yeah, I mean, really shout out to everybody that submitted a name because uh, they, they were I mean, it was the greatest weekend of my life getting to sit there and comb through all those submissions. <laughs> That that'd be a dream come true for me. I would love to go through a submission with any kind of professional sports team, most no notably a baseball club. So, yeah, I like the Leafs name, but I don't know. Would that be popular now with smoking? Would that would that be a connection there? Oh, so that, mm. that, that was. I'm just curious. That, no, no, you you're you're completely right. So on two fronts, we actually had that discussion. Um, the first one is. Tobacco still is the dominant cash crop in our area. So throughout Southern Virginia, uh, tobacco still is that, that dominant farmed product. However, there are a lot of farmers who are shifting their tobacco plants to hemp, uh, industrial hemp, woven hemp, um, other kinds of hemp uh, it, it are starting to be grown throughout the, the region. Um, the other part was, so we didn't want to tie ourselves again to something that didn't have a piece of Danville's future. Um, mm -hmm. So, so the Leafs was a great callback, but yes. what about it was looking forward. The other part that we did take into serious consideration, um, not only are we going to try to, to, you know, attract a new generation of baseball fans, not just here in Danville, but from around the country with, with the logo and the name and some of the entertainment that we'll be having. Um, but we also do understand that our partners with USA Baseball and Major League Baseball as entities have both made pretty strong outspoken statements against the use of tobacco products and, and the inherent health issues that, that lie there. So both of those, you know, kind of lines of thought did come into consideration yeah, specifically sense. with makes the Leafs. Yep. So uh, Austin, June the 3rd is the big day. Uh, are you planning on sleeping at all between now and then? No. No, uh, not, not even a little bit. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I was texting uh, Anderson Rathbun uh, down with the, you know, again, little brother in, in, in Burlington. Um, and I was telling him, I was like, man, it's taken me like six weeks to finish your episode. I usually listen to like four or five podcasts a week. I haven't even had time to listen to my normal ones. So I've been trying to get to get through, you know, like I, I have a friend with, with a podcast who has great minor league baseball guests. I try to listen to all of those. Don't tell him. I'm two and a half months behind on his. Um, it's been the most bananas four month stretch of my life. Um, I actually, uh, if you ever come visit, so I know you guys are going to be a couple of you guys are going to be in town in July. Um, instead of having a normal office chair across from my desk, I have a lazy boy. That's for two purposes. One, comfort is king, right? So when you come in to meet with the Otterbots, you're not treated like some plebeian, all right? You get a lazy boy. If you want to kick your feet up, kick your feet up. If you want to drink, we've got drinks Love in the that. fridge. The second part though is I do need somewhere to sleep in the office and it's literally right across from my desk. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so what's on the, uh, what's on the agenda? What's on the to-do list uh, that, that is probably pretty long between now and, and June the 3rd? 
So I'll answer this in two, two umbrella statements. The fun stuff, right? So we are still finalizing what our entertainment will look like. Um, obviously, this season will be different for a lot of reasons. The unfortunate, you know, you know, kind of umbrella and, and cloud that's hanging over all of us within the world of sports is, uh, you know, this little global pandemic that that is, you know, hopefully coming to, to the net at the end. Something um, going on? Yeah. Have you guys heard of this? No. Th- what are you talking it's, about? It's, I work at a hospital. I haven't heard of this. No. Th- there's, it's it's like, um it, you know, like it's a Modelo Landshark virus or one of those, uh, you know, yeah, drinkable beer viruses. I don't know, no, but um, it, it's it's going to be interesting. We're we're still waiting on um, you know, Virginia regulations to come down. We're still yeah. waiting for for local regulations. Um, we're still waiting for um, you know, quite honestly, uh, what is going to be best for our players and and coaching staff, right? So um, we have to have a top notch fan experience, one that nobody in in this town or in this region has ever seen. We have four, literally, plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D for what our weekly promotions will be, what our nightly promotions will be, and what those in-game promotions will be, given different circumstances, both capacity-related, mask-related, social distancing-related. Um, so it, it's been an interesting off-season, but that's what really gets me jazzed, right, is those kinds of conversations. So when we've got 27 home games – Whereas we normally would only get to plan for 27 events, we're essentially planning for 108 at this point. So it is fun. You, you get to think creatively. You always get to stay on your feet. Um, so a lot of that is, is the fun to do. The less fun to do, we walked into an empty ballpark in, in January. I mean, a completely stripped empty ballpark, no concessions equipment, no sound system, no phone, no internet. Um, we, we came in brand spanking new. So there have been a lot of those conversations. Um, you know, hey, where, where can we get drop coolers for concessions? Well, there are a lot of restaurants that closed down. Can we go, you know, get a, a lightly used drop you know, freezer? How far do we have to drive? What's the price difference? Is it worth it? Um, you know, how many taps are we going to have in the ballpark this year? At 50% capacity, do we want 50 taps in the ballpark? Or is that going to be a, a displeasing order amount with our beverage partners? Um, you know, what are the specialty menu items going to be if every concession item has to come in a closed top lid, right? Like you can't do, uh, you know, specialty French fries with a pile high of toppings if you have to have it in a styrofoam, you know, bin with with a lid on there, because then you'll get chili, cheese, chives, onions, whatever else stuck to the top of the fi- the styrofoam. Um, so there, there are the fun to do's. There are the not as fun to do's. Um, we've got brand new signage, brand new paint, brand new everything coming into the ballpark intern starting next week who I could not be more excited to have with us uh, absolutely studly crew of, of seven folks um, so yeah man it, it is you, you hit it. it it's it's too long to go over um, but it, it's all it's all good stuff but there definitely is the the you know segment that is more enjoyable than than the other part any parts of the game day that you can uh, give us a sneak peek of what, what fans can expect when they walk into the place yeah, a- absolutely. So um, I- I'm gonna I'm gonna go uh, I'm gonna tell an anecdotal story here. So my uh, degree is in religious studies. Um, I'm I'm not a sports management guy. I'm not an econ guy. Um, my baseball is religion, right? <laughs> yeah. It, so look, as a kid from Durham, what's the opening line from Bull Durham? I believe in the Church of Baseball. Susan yeah. Sarandon walking through downtown Durham on the way to the old Durham Athletic Park. You couldn't write a script like that except whoever wrote Bull Durham wrote a script like that. But uh, I, <laughs> I, I really, like, I, I didn't realize it at the time, but I, I was just infatuated with um, the concept of religion. I, I view it as a social history through the lens of religion, right? Different people, different places, different times. Everybody believes the same thing. Hey, just be nice to each other, right? But reading the scripture is super fun. Uh, <laughs> so I, I enjoyed it. Um, I actually wrote my, my undergraduate thesis, though, on the difference between sacred space and profane space. So there's this ancient Romanian uh, theologian philosopher named Mircea Eliada, who wrote about the the clear break in space between somewhere where he identified as sacred and somewhere where he identified as profane. The example he uses is a Catholic church, right? So if you are somebody who celebrates the Catholic faith, practices the Catholic faith, when you walk into a church, you feel like you are in a different presence, right? There's rituals. You cross yourself, you kneel, you pray, you go through the, the system. I, I am not Catholic. My family is Catholic. Um, but if I walk into an old Catholic church, I might love the stained glass, right? I might love the organ. I might admire the architecture. 
the priest might give a fantastic homily, right? Like there's all these different things, but intrinsically, it's not a spatial difference. So translate that to what we do every day at the ballpark. That gate is the threshold between profane space in the parking lot and sacred space inside the ballpark, right? So if we are not hitting you in the face with a different experience, as soon as you walk through the gate, we are not doing our jobs, right? So ticket takers, on their name tags in 99% of ballparks across the country, they might say ticket taker. For us, they are first impression representatives. They are that first point of contact for a fan as they break through that threshold from the parking lot. They leave their worries, their worst day of all time, their you know parental struggles, family issues, work problems. All of that is left behind when they cross that threshold. So live entertainment on the concourse, every which way you go, right? unique sounds coming through the PA system. We're constructing a brand new left field bar area that is going to be the second largest in terms of square footage outdoor drinking space in the city of Danville. Um, I'm talking bag toss, giant Jenga, uh, an old steam whistle. We're, we're going to have some fun over there. On the opposite side of the ballpark, we're going to have an expanded kid zone, right? So even on a thirsty Thursday, when we're pouring those dollar beers, like there's no tomorrow, you can still bring your family out. You can still bring your young kids and sit over in that right field section, have access to all sorts of activities and, and you know, attractions for them while being physically and, and you know, kind of uh, audibly removed uh, from the debauchery that will probably be taking place in, in left field. So um, I, I know Anderson did say this in, in his uh, episode with y'all, um, and I, I really do love him, all jokes aside, but the, the, the common theme between both here and Burlington, we are doing things much, much differently than they have ever been done before. And it starts from the moment you walk through the gate. It really, really does. You know, you're not going to believe this, Austin, but this is not the first time Rachia Aliata has been brought up on this podcast. No. You're kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wait a second. <laughs> Look, I, I was about to say we, we need to set another one up for like next week and just dive into his thought. Like that's immediately where I was going. <laughs> you know, I, oh I find it interesting that you talk about, um, you know, the first impression, first, first, uh, first representation funny enough, one of the big complaints I've had about going to Rogers Center, I mean, everybody complains about that it's a dome and, you know, it's outdated and whatnot. Uh, my biggest complaint, I, I've been going for, well, since 1989 when it opened. Not once have I ever been told, you know, welcome to Rogers Center. They don't, they don't, in Toronto, you don't get those, uh, in, like in some ballparks, like in Cleveland or Pittsburgh, the ushers are guys that have worked there forever and they know everything about baseball and they're just they love baseball no in, in toronto we get like teenagers right but i've been to ford field for the lions the most miserable football team in like the history of everything mm -hmm. every single time i go the security guys you know the guys who are checking to make sure if i have a gun or not who are supposed to be like grumpy looking welcome to ford field not once have i ever been told welcome to Rogers center that's shocking. such a little thing, but it, it 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 just makes an impression. Look, the the craziest thing to me um, about kind of the state of sports and entertainment today is there are still folks that um, that can't separate the product on the court or field and the product within the environment, right? Like I, again, I, I grew up in Durham. I went to Duke football games when Ted Roof and Carl Franks were respectively leading that team to 0 and 12 seasons more times than I can count, right? But Wallace Wade Stadium was awesome. It's the only stadium, well, now I guess the second, the, the first of two stadiums that the Rose Bowl game has been played in outside of Pasadena, right? Like the, the history there, the experience there, but they had face painters, they had balloon artists, they had, you know, those the uh, inflatable rundown games. It didn't matter that the football team was terrible. The experience was incredible. On the flip side, you go into Cameron, right? It's literally right across the parking lot. It's the greatest place to play basketball in the world, maybe besides Madison Square Garden. I don't know. I'm not a basketball guy. But um, you, you get that incredible atmosphere and that historic nature. But like you just said, the folks at the gate, the folks at the concession stand, the ushers, 
they all were making sure to go out of their way to make sure you had a great time. It didn't matter if Duke was going 38 no or, or, well, I mean, I guess during my lifetime, that's pretty much all they've done. But, I was going to say, um, <laughs> but, but it, it is, it's, it's crazy to me um, that there are still places within the sports and entertainment field that don't do literally everything in their power to provide a top notch fan experience. You know, uh, Paul, going back to your question, one of the, it's such a small change, right? I mean, this, this is a no brainer, no extra cost change that we're putting into into you know action this year we're not going to have a fan services or guest services center we're going to have a ballpark concierge and they're going to be wearing a tuxedo t-shirt rather than one of the staff shirts and if you need something around the ballpark you don't go to guest services you don't get you know directed to oh yeah it's the tent over there oh you have a question that i can't answer you can visit our ballpark concierge years just inside the gate about three steps to your right you can't miss him he's wearing a tuxedo t-shirt right like th those are the the little things um that end up going a long way in creating an unforgettable experience and um yeah i i just i i, I don't know anybody uh, at the rogers center but if i did i would be making an immediate phone call because it's unacceptable yeah that is unacceptable especially from toronto where everybody's pretty friendly up there so but it is minor league baseball. They do things a little bit differently. So, well, it sounds like a lot of exciting True. things are happening. Well, what about food options? Are we going to see, uh, obviously it's a pandemic, so there may be some limitations, but in the future. Are you trying to play in your menu already, Mark, when you go down? Yes, I am. <laughs> so the, the coolest thing that I can tell you right now, without going too far into it, uh, Jesse Jones hot dogs is a Danville original, right? So, the, the Martinsville Speedway, which is about 30 minutes to our east mm -hmm. uh, or to our west, rather, um, they are famous for their Martinsville dogs. Best kept secret in the world. They're just Jesse Jones hot dogs, but people go nuts over them, right? Like Jesse Jones, when we were asking, Good hustle. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> when, when we were asking, uh, you know, community leaders as part of that name, the team submission contest, you know, look across, you know, Fresno started it with the tacos, right? But every team now has a food moniker. They, they rebrand as a food. So when we're looking to rebrand the team, that's one of the questions we're asking, right? Like what foods are unique to Danville? Everybody talked about the hot dogs at Mama Possums. Mama Possums is this great little mom and pop shop right off Riverside Drive. It's incredible. But everybody was talking about Mama Possums hot dogs, Mama Possums hot dogs. So of course, the first place that I got lunch in the city of Danville when I moved here was I got hot dogs at Mama Possums. I realized very quickly, like after the first bite, oh, this is just a Jesse Jones hot dog. Like that, that's all this is. Uh, it, and and they, they do a great job of marketing it, but it's the original red hot dog. Um, you know, Chicago Red or Red Chicago, Red Hot Chicago has, has done a pretty good imitation. Um, but we, for the first time in at least the last 30 years, have Jesse Jones as our official ballpark hot dog. Um, so every hot dog that you have is going to be phenomenal, even if you eat it plain, which you're an insane person, but even if you eat it plain, um, <laughs> no you will have a, a, an incredible <laughs> hot dog. <laughs> no ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, we, I mean, we're gonna do um, we're, we're gonna do some different things at the concession stand, but we've got a pretty big uh, uh, plan to unveil some of them. So I can't give away too many secrets uh, right now. Okay, that's why all babies are insane, and I refuse to have a chub because they're nuts. They eat their hot dog plain and cut into little pieces. Yeah, what's you know, up with that? that? <laughs> we don't want them choking. That's like one of the number one things kids uh, choke on. Hey man, yep. teach them young. Hot dog. Teach them young. Hot dogs. <laughs> teach them young. You learn from adversity, right? Yeah, yeah. Just pull it out of there and then just don't do that again. You know. <laughs> For legal reasons, I'm kidding. <laughs> For legal no, so. reasons. No, yeah. No, I'd probably cut my kid's hot dog up if I had one. But yeah. One day. A hot dog now you can eat your hot dog on a roll. All right. I just don't let my kids eat them. They're horrible. <laughs> It depends which ones you get. They make they make gourmet well, hot dogs now with natural you know, ingredients and as no a fact, and all that junk. And here, 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 we're going on that tirade we were talking about earlier, Austin. Awesome. Um, <laughs> as a fat guy, hot dogs are just something I I just like. You know what? This is not good for me. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> you know. I well, know. At the ballpark, you have to have a hot. Some are better than others. Um, there's a certain brand that I can only get from uh, Michigan that I can find down here in Indiana. So I'm very you, picky. You Indiana know, beefs from Chicago are very good as well. Let me yeah. just put this out there. If you eat Nathan's, you're a commie. <laughs> it's a little salty. 
Oh. And all hot dogs are salty. That means it. my dad's a commie. I he would, grew up on the. I'm like, these are disgusting. <laughs> so, so, Austin, tell tell us, uh, give us a, a little bit of a sneak Dave's preview. Job. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dave. In there, man. Um, At least we didn't talk about pork roll. <laughs> do us a, do us say? a favor, especially for our, our our lucky people who actually get to travel there. So, what, what's what's the ballpark like? Man, so it's it's um it's one of the most unique ballparks that I've ever seen. Um, and and I won't go into the full history of it. I'll save that for for when I see you guys out at out at the park. But um, it's actually within a city park, a gorgeous city park. So if you put it into your Google Maps, it's actually something we're working on right now. More oftentimes than not, it'll say Dan Daniel Memorial Park closes at sundown. Are you sure you'd like to go? Yes, absolutely. I'm sure I'd like to go. What are you talking about? Um, but it's American Legion Post 325 Field within Dan Daniel Memorial Park. So when you get off Route 29, you pull off, you're driving up this road, you're covered in foliage. It's gorgeous. There are 38 miles or so of hiking and mountain biking trails that begin and end at Dan Daniel Park. There's 13 miles of the Riverwalk Trail that runs obviously right along, along Dan, uh, the Dan River that has access quite literally 50 meters away from our front gate. Um, within Dan Daniel Memorial Park, there are several picnic areas and gazebos. Um, there are two adult league softball fields. There are two little league baseball fields. There are two full-size football soccer fields. There's a great play structure. There's a beautiful veterans monument memorial. And then there's our ballpark. So you never have to worry about parking because there is so much going on at Dan Daniel that, that you will always have, have somewhere to park. Um, but right now, it has only ever played home to the Danville Braves. So the structure itself cannot be changed. Like the color is Braves blue. And that's okay because ours doesn't clash with that, with that royal blue. Um, but it is a, a confined ballpark surrounded by wildlife. Right. So wherever you are in the stands, when you look beyond the, the bounds of the field, you're seeing hills, mountains, trees, flowers, bushes, plants, deer, an occasional dead squirrel on the road. You know, the, these things that you can't get anywhere else. No, I'm, I'm kidding. But um, it, it's a really, really cool ballpark. Uh, the concourse is not 360. So it kind of goes from, you know, the, the right field bullpen all the way around to the left field bullpen great concession space, um, incredible concourse space where I, I don't know because I wasn't here and I didn't go to several games, uh, you know, while, while the Braves were here. I don't know how the concourse space was utilized in the past, but one of the blessings of walking into a completely barren ballpark is being able to completely reimagine how you utilize the space. Um, so there, there, are, there are just so many cool features um, that you won't see anywhere else. I don't want to ruin all those surprises, but I think that the big prominent one is that it is located within a city park that has so much else going on. Like it's, it's literally never a dead zone. There's always some sort of activity at Dan Daniel. Nice. Nice. Uh, yeah. yeah I can't wait to get down there. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, me too. So uh, would this be a proper time to bring up? Well, you know, like you mentioned, we had uh, your, your colleague down in Burlington on, a, on our podcast, the, a few weeks ago, uh, you know, he threw quite a lot of shade at you guys up in Danville. I mean, uh, what kind of, you guys are building the rivalry, uh, right? You're gonna hit the ground running with it, huh? So the the fun the fun part about my career journey um, is that it started well. It started as a game day staff member up in Madison, Wisconsin, with with the Mallards, which was awesome. Um, they great they ball. if they were great affiliated, atmosphere too, in, Wonder, incredible. Yeah. They. They, the, the coolest thing, and it's nightly, yeah. their mascot delivers the first pitch ball on a zip line, right? Like if you've ever been in a mascot costume, running for 10 feet. I actually is have. Awesome. I actually have. I have as well. Like <laughs> get, getting inside of one of those mascot costumes and then getting on a zip line and then flying down the entire left field line is insanity, right? They're incredible. But my first full-time, quote-unquote, full-time uh, baseball gig was an internship in – Burlington, North Carolina with the Burlington Royals, right? So um, I, at that point, hated the Danville Braves, right? Because this longstanding rivalry between Danville and Burlington had existed. Our season ticket holders at the time came up to Danville. 
their season ticket holders at the time went down to Burlington, right? Uh, and, and there was this great back and forth. There's actually great friendships. They won't admit it publicly, but there's great friendships between a lot of the season ticket holders from, from both of our teams that have known each other for, you know, going on 20, 30 years now. But um, it's, it's been a lot of fun uh, to not only know, but be friendly with uh, their full-time staff to know that when we throw something at them on social media, they're not going to take it personally. They're going to be able to throw something right back so that we can create this back and forth that's fun for everybody involved right? The people behind the keyboards and then everybody reading those exchanges. Um, we, we, we have a, a couple things up our sleeves uh, to, to activate during the season that are going to be great. Um, so with all that said, they're terrible. I hate them. We're going to beat them at literally everything. So <laughs> a little modest there, but that's good. That's good to hear. Has, I, you just mentioned there always has been a rivalry between the two towns in everything yes. or just baseball. So mostly just baseball. Um, thank yeah. goodness. Um, you know, the, the Dan River Mills, the Dan River Fabrics Mills um, were a, a dominant employer in the city of Danville for, for several decades. Um, similar to the, the textile mills that existed in Burlington, where obviously they derived their, their namesake from, which I know you guys covered. Um, but the, the cool thing about Danville to me is that had a, it, it's gone through ebbs and flows and it has very visible pieces of the town that call back to those different industries and different decades and different eras of, of the town's economy and, and population. Um, I, I don't know if um, I'm, I'm trying to think of how to word this. Uh, I, I don't know if the city of Danville has ever competed with another city. I feel like for, for most of its history, it has competed against itself, right? Like there, there have been a lot of moments where, you know, the mill held a lot of political power. So there was no outside industry allowed to come in, right? Tobacco was the dominant cash crop and the dominant industry in the early 1900s through the 1920s. Uh, and because of that, there was obviously a certain population um, that lived here. It was the tobacco farmers, the tobacco traders, the tobacco auctioneers, all three of those people made vastly different amounts of money, right? So we, we have a strip in Danville down Main Street that is called Millionaire's Row. And it's about 20 homes that are massive, late 1800s, early 1900s, gorgeous homes that were owned and, and run by the auctioneers who were taking, you know, I don't know, like 60% of the profit from, from the farmers and, and, and salespeople. Um, and then you have these, these areas of town that are still vastly farmland where we talked about earlier, kind of farmers have, have changed up here. Um, I don't know if the city has ever looked outward for that competition. I think there, it's always kind of been internal. From the baseball standpoint, I think it started when the city of Burlington got Danville's old stadium. Right. I, I mean, like that's a piece of history that you can't ignore. Um, they literally wouldn't have a, a place to play if it weren't for the folks that built that thing in Danville and then broke it down piece by piece and then trucked it down to Burlington, at least for the duration um, of the Danville Braves lifetime here. Uh, you know, they, they came to Danville from Pulaski. So Pulaski was the Braves. They were the Mariners for years, most recently the Yankees, the River Turtles. Are, it's a perfect moniker for, for that, you know, there. So uh, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Is that how you say? Pulaski? I, I say Pulaski. Um, Pulaski. If, you go to, if you go to Pulaski, there's a lot of people that will say Pulaski, you know, like with, with a little so bit more. So I've been saying that right. wrong as well. I, I'm still hung up on Appalachian. Appalachian. <laughs> And, I've been, and even, I, I, I'm from Jersey. I've been saying Appalachian for, for 37 years, and all of a sudden I got to change it? It's like Wilkes-Barre, Wilkes-Barre. You can say three different I'll words. say Wilkes-Barre until I'm dead. Oh, well, that's that's something we disagree on. All right, well, <laughs> so, wow, I, there's right and there's me. So there's a oh boy. So everything is said a little bit differently there. See, you don't know this until somebody corrects you. Well, so, and that's the no comment. The that's good to know thing about about baseball. And I know you, you guys know it is there. There are you know upwards of 220. Uh, as I like to call it, hometown baseball or community baseball teams, right? So that spans the the affiliated minor leagues, that spans the collegiate summer leagues, that spans the independent leagues, the professional or professional level um, without being major league, right? There are these amazing communities across the country in all 50 states, uh, 40, not 48 states, the continental United States, um, that, that you get to learn so much about the culture, the people, the times, the history, present day um, that you just wouldn't get anywhere else. And uh, actually the, the current president of the Appalachian League, Dan Mushan, um, said something to me when I was an intern that I'll never forget. 
He said, you're, you're beginning your journey in baseball. You will get out of this what you put in. And obviously that part was cliche, but he followed it up by saying, there is not another industry within the United States of America that will afford you the opportunities to live and work and contribute to communities across every single state, in small towns, in big towns, in tourist towns, in hometowns, in formerly thriving markets to currently booming markets, right? And he was right. And, and just in the course of my career, you know, going back to Madison, it's, it's a state capital in a relatively small state but it's a thriving college town, right? Like that's the lifeblood of the town is the University of Wisconsin. H Street. Exactly. Like, uh, and shout out uh, the the college club and, and Mondays and all those the Oof. bars that I spend entirely too much time and money yeah. at. Um, then Burlington, right, is a thriving former mill town that is now sandwiched in between two of the largest growing markets in the country. And I don't know if Anderson mentioned that, but RTP, right? Like Durham, Raleigh, Chapel Hill is directly to the east. And Greensboro is directly to the west. Burlington, Mebane, Eflin, these communities are, are getting beneficial, you know, kind of population growth from job opportunities that exist in those two areas. And now they have a booming, you know, kind of regrown, reimagined industry. Danville, I think, is, is much in the same way, right? Like uh, I've mentioned, you know, the tobacco, the trains, the textiles, but we really are now in a hotbed for a lot of the STEM manufacturing and, and advanced machining and precision manufacturing industry where we've got organizations like the Danville Science Center, the Wendell Scott Foundation, the Institute for Advanced Learning and Research, the Sova Innovation Hub, Aero Farms just broke ground on a three acre plot of land that inside the building will have a hundred acres of farmland, a hundred acres of farmland on a three acre plot of land, right? Like there, there are pretty incredible things happening here. Um, and then Greensboro was a booming metropolis when I was there. Daytona Beach is a city of 62,000 people that sees 12 million visitors come through, right? So I've been in those small towns. I've been in the big markets. I've been in the college towns. I've been in the, the tourist markets. There are things that work literally everywhere you go. If you focus on community, if you focus on entertainment, if you start local and stay local, everything else will fall into place. And, and I think that's kind of the mindset that we're bringing here is, look, we're, we're not reinventing entertainment. We're not rewriting the script for minor league baseball. We are just bringing that new reinvigorated, reimagined energy to this incredible community. And this, this, you know, again, scenic, gorgeous ballpark. That's just simple, but very good advice to hear. So that's kind of what you want to, that's what you expect at the local ballpark. And I assume all 10 teams probably talk shop from time to time. It's a, it's a good brotherhood fraternity. It, it, it's a great group of folks, man. Like yeah. this, this league is unlike any other league that I've ever been You're a part right. of. I agree with um, you on that. In, in a lot of ways, right? Like um, we, we have teams in the league that are technically nonprofits, right? That, that are run just so differently from any business experience that I've ever had. Um, we have teams that have, you know, full-time staffs of five or six people. I was the only staff member from January until literally last week when I hired two, you know, additional full-time staff members. So we're a staff of three, Burlington's a staff of two, um, internships range, city populations range. Um, it, it's one of the most tight knit groups uh, of folks that, that I've ever seen though, at a league level, um, in large part due to, you know, kind of the stalwarts that have been in their positions with their teams for, I mean, God knows how many years. But, um, you, you know, shout out to, to Kingsport. Um, you know, Steve Bryce was recently announced as, as their new general manager. Steve was the general manager in Burlington, you know, we, you know a, a decade ago or so. Um, it, it's an incredible community of people. And um, especially this year with so many changes, being able to have collaborative conversations with people across the league just to talk about best practices. Um, you know, one of our general managers is actually the mayor of his town. Um, so he he has access to information and insights um, that only elected officials would have. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm going to steal a line from Dan here. For legal purposes, we definitely haven't shared any of that information. Um, but it, it's it's been really, really cool to, to be a part of this kind of, uh, like you said, it is, it is a pretty yeah. tight or a tight knit fraternity. Yeah, that, and that's something you probably don't see in some of these other leagues. But then again, maybe maybe you do. But at the Appalachian League always has been this very unique league, even when it was affiliated. Uh, I just don't think just don't think you can find too many other leagues quite like it. The small towns, the quirky ballparks. I mean, Boyce Cox has to be one of the the kookiest ballparks I've ever been to. 
but I had a great time there. It was packed with people. It was a beautiful night. Couldn't ask for anything more. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. <laughs> so Austin, I know that you're up against it. You got places to go, people to see, things to do. So I guess this might be a, a good time to thank you for coming on the show and uh, talking with us for a little while. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, just just one other thing that I that I wanted to mention um, for folks that that listen to this podcast, the the coolest thing that we were able to do early on in in the process when we were still the Danville Baseball Club, kind of still working through that rebrand process, um, was we we started our social media accounts from scratch. Obviously, right? We're we're a new organization, new ownership, new management, um, and we we started a, a program called uh, the Official Ambassador Program. Um, and Paul, if I'm not mistaken, you are either an ambassador or vice ambassador. Am I am I right in in thinking that or no? No, but you know, if if you're offering me the position, let's <laughs> let's talk salary. <laughs> We'll talk. So no, so we we have a we have an incredible uh, local fan base, obviously, of the folks who have been fans of of Danville baseball for generations. Um, but for what it's worth, we also had a season ticket holder waiting list of over forty people um, that we've now about shrunk in half after the the you know kind of capacity restriction was lifted from thirty percent to fifty percent. Um, but the amount of local excitement for this new era of entertainment and baseball cannot be put into words. I, I don't think it can be quantified. It's been so exciting. More than that, though, I do want to thank all of you, first of all, for having me on and, and for being supportive, um, but also to all of those fans around the country who have resonated with what we're trying to do. Um, we sold merchandise to 34 states or 35 states in the first 36 hours. We're up to 46 states. It would have been smart of me to do the research into what those four states were before I came on this podcast so that I could tell people if you live in that state Rhode that Island. I'll toss you a 5% discount or something. But um, it, it has been really, really phenomenal um, to, to see the response. So I, I just want to thank uh, hashtag Bots Nation um, from here Bots in Danville Nation. to throughout Southside Virginia, uh, up and down the East Coast, around the country and around the world for the support so far. Um, we are at Go Otterbots on all all social platforms. If you search it in Facebook, we'll pop up. That's our handle on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and uh, yeah, man, we, we literally could not be more excited for the season. Like I said earlier, I'm probably going to cry on opening night. Yeah, it's going to happen. Like a, a season without baseball and we're finally going to be back. Like that's that's going to be a romantic, emotional time. Um, but yeah, this, this was awesome. So I, I can't thank you guys enough and um, not just for having me, but for also the, the support that you've shown. Anytime, Austin. Glad to have you on.